Okay, so this video is going to be a review of complex numbers, which probably most, if not all of you have seen before, but you know, maybe there'll be certain properties I say today that you forgot or you need to brush up on or whatever. Um, so hopefully this is helpful. And also I'm going to be showing a lot of properties that we use all the time in this course. So complex numbers are absolutely everywhere in EC45. And a lot of these properties that I'm going to show in this video, um, we use literally all the time. Um, and so it's going to be really important that they're all familiar to you and you understand them all and uh, you're comfortable applying them yourself in problems. So that's the goal. So we're going to talk about complex numbers. Okay, so I'm going to let Z be a complex number. Z is going to be a complex number throughout this video. And I'm going to write it at this point as A plus JB. Okay, so this is what's known as rectangular form for complex numbers. So rectangular form. Okay, Z plus Z is A plus JB. And here, of course, J is the square root of negative one. So in math, a lot of people use the letter I for this, but in electrical engineering, I is often used as current. Not so much in this class, because we're not going to deal with circuits too much, uh, except for at the beginning. But in general, I is used in electrical engineering. And so we tend to use J instead of I for the square root of negative one. So we'll be doing that in this class. And then A and B are real numbers. Okay, so that's rectangular form. And we have names for these A and B variables. So A is what's called the real part of Z. This is the real part of Z. And B, not JB, just B, is the imaginary part of Z. Some people think this whole thing is the imaginary part. Like I mean some students and that's not the case. It's just, just this B, that's the imaginary part. of Z, okay? So that is rectangular form. We have a real part plus J times an imaginary part, okay? And you can draw the complex plane here. So the complex plane, we have a real axis and an imaginary axis. And so, I don't know, maybe A is here and B is here, and maybe that's our point Z, okay? But there's another form, another form for a complex number. And you can think of it as saying, okay, well, to get to Z, I went, a units on the real axis, and then B units on the imaginary axis and follow that path to get to Z. But there's other things we can do. One thing we can do is we can move an angle theta out from the positive real axis and then start at zero and move along um, from the origin. This is the origin right there. Move along from the origin to our point Z. That's another way to get to any number in the complex plane. Okay, and that's what's known as polar form. So Z can also be written as R times E to the J theta, where R is greater than or equal to zero and a real number, and theta is a real number. And this is polar form of a complex number. And we call R the magnitude, and it's just the square root of A squared plus B squared, the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, right? Because you can think of this as a right triangle at point Z. So this is A and this is B. And so by the Pythagorean theorem, that means this, this hypotenuse R has to be the square root of A squared plus B squared. And then theta, A theta, uh, in this triangle, you can see that theta is the inverse tangent of B divided by A, right? Because the tangent of theta is B over A. So inverse tangent of B over A is that theta. Um, but I'm actually going to put this inverse tangent in quotes, okay, because it's actually not just inverse tangent. I'll show you exactly what I mean. Uh, a lot of people write it like that just so they don't have to, you know, write something strange. Um, but it's not technically just the inverse tangent of B over A. Uh, you have to be aware of where your point is in the complex plane, like which quadrant it's on. But I'll get to that in one second. Uh, for now, I'm just going to give some more notation. So. We denote the magnitude of Z by those vertical bars. So if Z is a real number, we call that absolute value. But for a complex number, we call it magnitude. And all it is is the distance 
from the origin to your complex number. Okay, and then this theta we denote as that kind of angle symbol Z. That's the angular phase. Okay, so this is the magnitude, and this is the angle or phase. Okay, of Z. All right, so now back to this inverse tangent quotes. Let me just give you an example to show you what I mean about how it's not technically that, okay, but it's almost that. So let's say we have a point down here and the real and imaginary parts are both negative one. So this is negative one minus J, that's that complex number. Okay, and we want the angle of that number. Well, what do we do? Well, we draw a line from that number to the origin and then we go from the positive real axis all the way around. Okay, and that is our theta. That entire angle is our theta. Okay, but what happens if we just do the inverse tangent of B over A? We get the inverse tangent of negative one over negative one. That's the inverse tangent of one, which is pi over four. And all that's telling us is this angle, right? That's just that angle, pi over four. So that's not the angle I actually want, right? But that's what the inverse tangent gives me. So I gotta say, but the angle of Z here, this is my Z, is actually pi over four, and then you have to add this entire pi, right? You gotta add that pi and then the pi over four, and that's the angle that we've defined for a polar form. So this is pi over four plus pi, which is five pi over four. So that's actually the angle of the complex number negative one minus j. Okay, so it's not actually inverse tangent, but you can always use inverse tangent to get the quantity that you need to be able to discover the angle. You just have to always be aware of where in the complex plane you are so you can know if you have to add pi or not. Turns out all you ever have to do is add pi. Um, so like, you can look this up. So the function to look up is called a tan two. Oops, not squared, a tan two. And it's pretty much inverse tangent on the complex plane. It gives you the angle. So you can look that up to get the full definition, but essentially all it is, is you have to know where you are in the complex plane and then use inverse tangent, neither add pi if you need to or not to get the actual angle. Okay, so that's why I always like to draw a picture. So like if my point was right here, right? If I did inverse tangent, Turns out I would have to add pi. You can try that point out, out for yourself for practice. Okay, so if the real part is negative, if you're over here, you have to add pi to the inverse tangent. If you're over here, you don't. Okay, so if you want to remember like, it like that, that's fine. But I usually in this class will just draw it out every time you need it. And you know that, that's the way I can be sure that it's right. So whatever works for you, but I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, but sometimes I might write inverse tangent, but what I really mean is this a tan two. So you have to, you know, know from context. I'll try to make it absolutely clear. And sometimes I might just leave it as just the angle. But anyway, so that is an important point. Okay, so uh, now let's say we are given a number in polar form, right? Let's say we're given a number in polar form. How can we find the rectangular form of that number? We can find the rect form, okay? Here we went from rectangular form to polar form, right? Now we're trying to make sure we can go the other way and we can. And you can just think about this picture again. So if this is my R and this is my theta, then what are these two side lengths? Right? That'll give me the real and imaginary parts. Well, cosine of theta is this side length divided by R. So that means that side length, which is the real part, is just R cosine theta, right? Because cosine theta is A divided by R. So just bring R to the other side. And similarly, B is just R sine theta, okay? And that works in general, so there you go. So sometimes you might need to go back and forth between polar form and rectangular form because sometimes things in this class are easier to do with polar form than rectangular or vice versa. So you gotta be fluent and comfortable with both. Uh, you definitely can't be converting, you know, always to rectangular or always to polar. We're actually gonna do a lot of things in this class in polar form. So it's good to get comfortable with both of them. Okay, so now let's talk about the magnitude and angle of products and divisions. Okay, so what's up with the magnitude of Z1 times Z2? Okay, well, what would you want to be true? You would love if this was the product of the magnitudes of Z1 and Z2, and it actually is. So we can prove that really quickly. And if you, if any of these properties seem surprising to you, I definitely encourage you to uh, 
maybe watch this and then look away and try and rederive some of these yourself because that'll help them stick a lot better. So let's just say Z1 and Z2 have polar forms that look like this. Then I can combine the R1 and R2 and the exponentials. Okay, and now we have right here a complex number in polar form. There's the magnitude and there's the phase. So what's the magnitude here? Well, it's just R1 times R2, right? But remember, R1 actually is the magnitude of Z1 and R2 is the magnitude of Z2. So there you go. So the magnitude of the product is the product of the magnitudes. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, something that we're gonna use a lot is actually the magnitude of a division of two complex numbers. Okay, but it's pretty simple to do because we can just do the magnitude of Z1, right, times one over the magnitude of Z2. Okay, so this is just the magnitude of Z1 by the first property, right? These are two complex numbers, so I can split them up. Z1 times one over the magnitude of Z2, and that's what we want. Actually, you know what? I do have to prove this. Hold on, let me do one more step. I just noticed this is good. So it's technically times the magnitude of one over Z2. So that's what the above property told me. I have this times this. The magnitude of that product is the product of the magnitudes. But then I took one step that I didn't realize I was taking. I still need to figure out what the magnitude of one over a complex number is. So let's do that real quick, but that's easy enough. Um, magnitude of one over a complex number. Okay, that's the magnitude of one over, let's just say that complex number is r e to the j theta. Well, this is just the magnitude of one over r times e to the negative j theta, right? That's how um, magnitudes work, or sorry, that's how uh, exponentials work. When I divide by e to some power, I'm just doing e to that negative power. Well, now I have a complex number. There's the magnitude and the angle is just negative theta. So the magnitude there is just one over r, which is one over the magnitude of z. Okay, so that's another useful property. I think a lot of these you probably have seen before or maybe even just take for granted, but these are the proofs. Okay, so the magnitude of one over a complex number is just one over the magnitude of the complex number. And so that allows us here finally to write this like this, which is just the magnitude of Z1 divided by the magnitude of Z2. Okay, great. So now we know the magnitude of a product or a division of two complex numbers you can kind of split up the magnitude. It's either the product of the magnitudes or the division of the magnitudes. Okay, so that's useful. And what about the angle? What about the angle of Z1 times Z2? Okay, well, similar thing. This is just the angle of R1, R2, E to the J, theta one plus theta two. We already multiplied those above, right, right there. And now this is the angle of a complex number. There's the magnitude and there's the phase. So the angle of this is just theta one plus theta two. But wait a second, those are the, the angles of Z1 and Z2. Okay, so the angle of a product of complex numbers is the sum of their angles. Okay, what about the angle? We're gonna follow a similar pattern as we did above. What about the angle of one over Z? This is just the angle, what was one over Z? We found it here. One over R e the negative J theta. Now this is a complex number. There's the magnitude. And without the J, what I circled is the phase, which is just negative theta. And sure enough, that is negative angle of Z. Okay, so that's the angle of one over Z. And now we can get the angle of Z1 over Z2 using the product property, right? Using this product property, this is the angle of Z1 plus the angle of one over Z2. And then using this property, I can see that that angle of one over Z2 is just the negative angle of Z2. So the angle of Z1 minus the angle of Z2. And we're gonna be using these properties all the time in class. So I just thought it'd be nice to see the proof and definitely um, try to verify them on your own if any of this is confusing. Okay, next topic is conjugation, which is also going to play a huge role in this class. We're gonna be conjugating complex numbers all the time. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if I have some number z that in rectangular form is a plus jb, or in polar form is r e to the j theta, then we can define the complex conjugate of z, which we denote z with an asterisk in the exponent, as a minus jb. So I take the j and negate it, or as r 
times e to the negative j theta. So again, I take the j and negate it. So what does this look like in the complex plane? Well, if I have some z here, then what am I doing? Well, all I'm doing is keeping the real part of z the same and negating the imaginary part. So the real part here is going to stay the same, and the imaginary part is just going to flip. Okay, so z conjugate is down here. So you can remember this as all you do to get a conjugate is you mirror the point across the real axis. That's all that's happening. The real part stays the same. The imaginary part gets negative. Okay, so like the complex conjugate of that number is right up there. Complex conjugate of that number is up there, right? So you just mirror it across the real axis. And also you can see in polar form, right, that their magnitudes are the same, right? This is a isosceles triangle right there. Okay, so these distances are clearly the same and the angle is just gonna get negated. If that's theta, this is negative theta. Okay, and that's where this polar form comes from. Magnitude R is the same, the angle is just negative theta. Okay, and one other thing to note is that if what happens if Z actually equals its complex conjugate? Well, if a number equals itself mirrored across the real axis, then it's gotta be on the real axis, right? Anything not on the real axis is gonna get, give you a different point when I reflect over the real axis. So all the, complex, all the numbers whose complex conjugates are themselves have to lie on the real axis. In other words, Z is a real number. You can also see that here, if A plus JB equals A minus JB, well, the A is obviously equal. And the only way JB equals negative JB is if B is actually zero. In other words, Z equals A, and that's a real number. Okay, let's look at some more properties using convolution or conjugation. So what happens when I multiply z and its complex conjugate? I get r e to the j theta times r e to the negative j theta. e to the j theta times e to the negative j theta, those exponents, when I add them, I get theta minus theta. That's just zero. So I just end up with r squared, which is the magnitude of z squared. Okay, so z times its conjugate is the magnitude of z squared. And that tells us the magnitude of z is actually the square root of z times its conjugate. Okay, so these are all useful properties. What happens when I add z and its conjugate? When I get a plus jb plus a minus jb, the jbs cancel, I just get 2a. What happens when I subtract the conjugate from z? I get a plus jb minus a minus jb. The a's now cancel, and I get jb minus minus jb, which is 2jb. So what does that tell us? Well, what was a? A was the real part of Z. A was the real part of Z. So that means the real part of Z, I can just bring this two to the other side, is actually Z plus Z conjugate divided by two. And the imaginary part of Z, which was B, just divide by 2J, I get Z minus Z conjugate divided by 2J. People all, always miss that J. Okay, so make sure you got it in there. This is why you need it. Okay, so these are the real and imaginary parts, and these uh, expressions can be very useful, and we'll be using them a lot in this class for sure. I keep saying that, but it's just because every one of these, I think of all the times we use it in class, and they really are all very useful. Okay, now I already said this, but I'll just say it explicitly. The magnitude of Z is the magnitude of that, which is R, but as we already said, that's also the magnitude of E R times E to the negative J theta, which is the magnitude of Z conjugate. So the magnitudes of Z and Z conjugate are equal. We already saw that in the picture. And how about the angle? We already know what the answer is gonna be, but I'll do it anyway. Okay, this is just theta, and that's negative negative theta, which is negative the angle of R e to the negative J theta, okay, which is negative angle of Z conjugate. Okay. So when I conjugate a number, the magnitude stays the same. I mean, you can just remember this picture. The magnitude stays the same, right? Because I'm just reflecting over the real axis and the angle gets negated. That's what happens when you conjugate. All right. What happens if I conjugate a sum? Well, you'd love it if this was the sum of the conjugates. And yeah, it is. So we get A1 plus JB1 plus A2 plus JB2 conjugate. 
So now I'm going to turn the middle thing into a complex number. I'll just say that the real part is a1 plus a2, and the imaginary part is b1 plus b2. Well, now I have a regular old complex number, real part plus j times the imaginary part. So when I conjugate that whole thing, I just get the real part minus j times the imaginary part. But now, of course, I can split all these up again. I get a1 minus jb1 plus a2 minus jb2. And this is just the conjugate of z1 plus the conjugate of z2. Okay, so of course, if I had z1 minus z2, you can just put a negative everywhere. You're going to get z1 conjugate minus z2 conjugate. Okay, so adding and subtracting conjugates, uh, or if I conjugate the addition or subtraction of two complex numbers, I just get the addition or subtraction of their conjugates. What about multiplying? Well, again, what you'd hope to be true is true. And notice how when I want to prove things with uh, multiplying complex numbers, I use polar form. Polar form is really nice for multiplying things because the magnitudes multiply and the angles, you can just add them because complex the, these uh, complex numbers, the uh, e to the j angles, right? When I multiply exponentials, I add their angles. Okay, so it's easy to uh, multiply complex numbers in polar form, and you can see when I'm doing properties involving adding or subtracting, I use rectangular form because it's easy to do, easy to add and subtract numbers in rectangular form. So just things to keep in mind. Uh, so what do we have here? Well, again, I'm going to turn the inside into a complex number, r1 times r2 times e to the j theta1 plus theta2, conjugate. Now it's just a complex number, and I know how to conjugate that. Magnitude stays the same, and I just conjugate or I uh, put a negative sign on the J. Okay, and now of course I can split these up. So I get, I'll do it over here. I get R1 e to the negative J theta one times R2 e to the negative J theta two. And of course that is Z1 conjugate times Z2 conjugate. And of course you could do the same thing with division. So the product or division two complex numbers, if I conjugate that, I just get the same operation applied to the conjugates. Okay, so that's all, that's all nice. And now we come to one of the most important things in this class, which is Euler's formula. Okay, we are going to be using this all the time. Okay, so you gotta make sure that this makes complete sense to you. So what is going on here? Well, again, I'll draw the complex plane and I'm gonna draw the unit circle. So this is the circle with radius one, okay? I'm going to pick some point on the circle, and I'm going to call it e to the j x. Okay, x is obviously the angle here, but I'm using x because I don't want you to get confused and think this only works if x is like some number theta. Okay, we're going to be doing uh, things in this class where that x might be a whole expression. It might be like e to the j omega t plus some phase. And this property, Euler's form, is still going to work just fine. So that's why I'm using x instead of just theta to make try and uh, let you understand how general this is. Okay, so what does Euler's formula say? Well, Euler's formula gives us a way to write this e to the jx in a different way. And how can we get at that? Well, let's draw a right triangle again. Let's draw a right triangle. Okay, it doesn't have to be, it sort of looks like it's a 45, 45, 90. I'll make it a little different. Okay, so we know that this point's on the unit circle, which means that this hypotenuse has to be one, right? This distance has to be one, we're on the unit circle. And e to the jx, right? That's just a complex number with magnitude one and angle x. So I can put an x in that angle. So the question is, what is the length of this side and the length of this side? In other words, what's the real and imaginary parts of this number? Okay, well, we kind of already did this before, I think. But this angle x, if I just do cosine of x, I get this length divided by one. Well, that means this length has to be cosine of x, and this has to be sine of x. Okay, and so what does this tell us? This is Euler's formula. e to the jx is cosine of x plus j sine of x. Okay, and I'm going to even write here, this is very important in EC45 and otherwise, but definitely in EC45. Okay, we're going to use this everywhere. Okay, what else can we do with this? Well, using things we did above, uh, the property from above, 
we can also get two other expressions that are very useful in this class. What if I wanted to write cosine of x in terms of these e to the jx terms? How could I do that? Well, notice here that cosine of x is actually the real part of this complex number e to the jx. Where have we seen that before? Well, look right here. The real part of a complex number is that number plus its conjugate divided by two. And the imaginary part is that number minus its conjugate divided by two j. So this brings us to two extremely important expressions that, that we use in this class. We can say cosine of x is just the real part of e to the jx. And that means that it has to be e to the jx plus its conjugate, which is e to the negative jx, divided by 2. Well, that's pretty cool. Cosine of x, we can now write in terms of these complex exponentials, right, e to the jx. And sine of x is just the imaginary part of e to the jx. And we said that that is the complex number, e to the jx, minus the conjugate of that complex number, which is e to the negative jx. Move this down a little bit. Divided by 2j. Okay, so that is an alternate expression for sine of x, as crazy as it looks, especially considering cosine and sine are real functions, real value. And these things over here have tons of complex numbers in them. But it turns out that all the complex parts of these two expressions, as we saw when we proved this property, cancel each other out. And what you're left with is just cosine and sine. Okay, so everything on this page, Euler's formula right there. And uh, these two expressions for cosine sine, again, just to say it one more time, I'm going to use them all the time in this class. So make sure you really understand how we got them and understand uh, what they're trying to say. Okay, so that's all I have for this complex number review. Of course, there's things that I have not said today about complex numbers because there's just so much, but I think most of what we use in this class um, can be derived or understood, hopefully, from what I've presented here. So uh, great. So that's it for this video, and I will see you in the next one.